Okay, so I'm guessing 80%. Actually, no, 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 more like 95% of you know what this represents. And for the other 5%, no, it's not the flag of Denmark. Super Smash Brothers. I don't even know where to begin. Let me put it this way. I'm a huge fan of the series. Yes, I own every game. Yes, I have hundreds of hours clocked in the Ultimate. Yes, I almost cried when Banjo was announced. Do I need to prove my case any further? Each game in the series kind of took the gamer section of the world by storm. I mean, even if you don't play games, you ask anyone if they played Smash, and more often than not, do they say, yes, followed by a I main Kirby. And to that, I respond, wow, that's a downer because they usually spam the noun special. Never have I seen a series make the world shake quite like Smash. From blowing up the internet to making full-grown men poop their pants in excitement, for a while now, it feels like not even a game, but an event. Saying Smash Bros. is one of the most influential series ever created is not an understatement. It's a celebration of gaming as a whole. Crossovers and collaborations we've never seen before. All these icons coming together to create something beyond special. But of course, all of this is old news for some. To most of you out there, I probably sound like a broken record on this topic, but Smash Bros. is truly one of the biggest, most influential series ever created. With the conclusion of Smash Bros. Ultimate's development, it got me thinking of the earlier years of Smash. You know, like the humble beginnings and where it all began. Obviously, with a series like Smash, it would take some time to get where it is today, and with every progressive installment, it just kind of seemed like it overshadowed the previous game more and more, which is why today, I want to take a trip back to that humble 12-character roster, you know, like the era of four-player couch play, and where arguably the most influential game series got its start. So without further ado, let's take a look at the series first, Super Smash Bros. Super Smash Bros. Our story begins in 1999, when two developers at Nintendo, Masahiro Sakurai and Satori Iwata, wanted to make an original four-player fighting game for their latest 64-bit beast, the Nintendo 64. They wanted to differentiate themselves from the crowd and make it not only a platform fighter, but also a giant crossover between Nintendo's most beloved character. Wait, like a, a, cro a crossover? <laughs> like a, a melding together? <laughs> the closest crossover Mario and Link had at the time was the frickin' Nintendo serial system in the 80s, and even in that, the serial packaging was separate. Okay, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but what I will say is this was uncommon, especially for Nintendo. There would be your hidden cameo here and there, but never to the extent of Donkey Kong slapping Samus's big mother brain back to Brinstar. This was a concept not really seen too often. Nowadays, crossover platform fighters are mainstream. After the crazy success of Smash Ultimate and its conclusion, companies saw just how huge this concept could be and are now trying to capitalize on the crossover craze. You see this in Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl and Multiverses, it's gotten to the point where I honestly wouldn't be surprised if I saw a trailer with Mickey Mouse getting strangled by Sub-Zero in Carson City Saloon from the hit 2000 film Shanghai Noon starring Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson. Now this would have a lot of wow factor if you know what I'm saying. Smash Bros has had an impact in the fighting genre for quite a while now, and obviously crossovers did exist at the time, but I would argue Nintendo had the best lineup of characters to make the concept really stand out. By 1999, Nintendo had already established icons in not only Nintendo's history, but the gaming industry as well, which made for the perfect storm of bringing some of gaming's best all together to kick the crap out of each other. And thus, Smash Bros was born. See, here it is, right here in the flesh. Now, Smash's differences compared to other fighters at the time wasn't just in its roster, but also its gameplay. Instead of the oversaturated 1v1 Street Fighter style, they opted to create a more freeing and simplified platform fighter with bigger stages and more mobile movesets, on top of replacing the typical health bar with a percentage meter instead. It was these two elements that really set itself apart from everyone else and solidified the foundation of the Smash series going forward. 
I'm sure by now you guys know how Smash works, but for the other 5% of you Denmark fans, this one's for you. Typical fighters before Smash mainly stuck to arcade 1v1 hit opponent till yellow meter runs out type gameplay, but as mentioned before, Smash decided to take a different approach and replace the standard health bar with a percentage meter instead. Basically, the more you take damage, the higher your percentage goes up, which in turn makes you get knocked back further and further. Your goal is to slap and clap your opponents, build up their percentage, and send them flying off stage into the off-screen blast zones. And bada bing bada boom, that my friends is the smash of the brothers. It was a very unique fighting formula, especially in the 90s, and even today companies have tried to replicate it but never has had that charm Smash brings to the table. Looking back, it really surprises me just how good they designed this brand new fighting style. Like, they got most of the core mechanics of Smash right on their first try. And to me, that's impressive. It's simple enough for everyone to understand, but also a more advanced competitive fighting game on a technical level. And all this action can be experienced with up to four players. It appeals to so many people, and judging by these sales numbers, I'm sure there was more than one all-nighter experience with this chaotic party mess of a fighting game. Although the gameplay was unique and fun, I would argue it wouldn't have had the same impact if the characters represented weren't anywhere to be found, and it was important to get that roster right. Mario, Donkey Kong, Link, Samus, Yoshi, Kirby, Fox, and Pikachu were the original eight characters you saw when booting up the game for the first time. To the average Smash player, you would think this is outrageous, and if I'm being honest, I get surprised every time I come back and see this. But I think this is a solid starting lineup, with the top row representing Nintendo in the 80s, and the bottom representing the newer era of Nintendo in the 90s. Throw in a couple of unlockables, and you have the very first full Smash cast. Ever since the beginning, Smash has made representation a big priority, and judging by the starting cast, they represented Nintendo all across the board respectively. Some characters more known, and others not so much, but this was it. This was Nintendo to a T in 1999, and looking at it from a game design point of view, this was smart, and the 11 characters picked were solid all around. Notice how I said 11. It was a win-win, because not only was Nintendo showcasing their most relevant characters, <laughs> well, almost, but each one was diverse and had unique movesets and feel, ranging from the fast-paced F-Zero Madman to the floaty sidekick kid, or this pink flying blob, and when you play as this giant ape, you really feel like a giant ape. Shoutouts to uh, all you gaming journalists out there. The way the game has you familiarize yourself with each character is pretty neat too. I mean, just playing the game helps no duh, but coming back to this game years later, I've realized that the break the target side mode was a neat way to teach the player about each character's moves and attacks. And the same can be said about the other mode, board the platforms, but instead of focusing on attacks, it tests your skill on each character's mobility. Every character has their own unique stage layout with different hazards and ways to go about completing it, and I think this was a fun and smart way to expand your knowledge of the game. I don't know, just coming back to this game and seeing each character's special minigame stage was pretty fun and may have had some more thought put into them than I once realized. The classic mode is a pretty fun single player romp as well. You make your way through a gauntlet of challenges and events, mostly consisting of fighting this dude or fighting this family. It all leads up to this epic final battle against Master Hand, which I admit is still pretty sick to this day. I think the classic mode is a fun idea. I like the events, the minigames, Master Hand. Only gripe I have with it is it's the same thing every time. Same fights, same events, same everything. After playing it once or twice, it's like an open bag of Doritos. It gets stale fast. Which leads me right into really my main complaint with the game. Aside from the classic mode and the two bonus games, all you really have is the versus matches, which is where you'll get most of your mileage anyway, but that's it. <laughs> that is all of it. All the modes and unlockables can be experienced within a couple of days of playing it, which can kind of be a bummer for some. Smash Bros can have endless amounts of content from a party game point of view, but for some, it can be very limiting. If you're wanting to play this game on your own, all you really have is the classic mode or beating up some CPUs and verses. And everything else it has to offer can be unlocked and beaten so fast it starts to lose its value pretty quickly. I mean, playing this game for the first time, you obviously wouldn't unlock everything within your first session, but you would experience a vast majority of all its content within a day or two. To cut it some slack, it is mainly a multiplayer focused game and shines brightest playing with the full group. It's just a real shame that the game had to suffer from lack of content. 
However, in the grand scheme of things, I think they made up for it in multiple different ways. One major thing that I will always have respect for Sakurai and his team is the amount of effort they put into every single detail, even in the most minuscule of them. And when I say minuscule, I literally mean including small sprites of both King DDD and Ridley in their own game's stages. Like, I love that. I love small details and cameos like that. Yes, the game may suffer from lack of content, but in the small amount you do get, it is a very polished and well thought out package. You see this in almost every aspect of the game, from right when you boot it up, to the attack origins from certain characters, or references from specific stages and items, and like, geez, it just doesn't like, it doesn't stop. Ness's forward smash is a reference to his bat he would use in battles in Earthbound. The giant hammer item is a callback to the Donkey Kong arcade power-up. Oh, what about like Yoshi's stage referencing the super happy tree from the N64 game Yoshi Story? Or get this, the motion sensor mine from GoldenEye 007. I can't can't make this stuff up. They even included this data menu with different logs of each character and where they originated from. As a kid who had no idea who the heck Captain Falcon was, this was uh, very much appreciated. I mean, there's things in this game they didn't even need to bother with, like for example the way each character enters into battle. Examples being Star Fox coming out of his R-Wing, or Donkey Kong bursting out from his Donkey Kong Country barrel. It's such a small touch of polish that goes a long way. Aside from the detailed work and representation, I think the gameplay itself was also focused on getting fine-tuned. I mean, this was their first Smash game after all. Fighting feels and sounds satisfying, although the controls feel a bit clunky and dated nowadays. Then again, when you're designing a fighting game with this as your controller, you've kind of already lost at that point. It could just be that I live in the luxury of modern day Smash controls, but for their first attempt, it's really not that bad. Although Smash 64 didn't get as much love in the content side of things, I would argue it was made up in its polish and fine tuning in almost everything else. It's pretty crazy looking back and seeing Sakurai's standards of detail because it's never changed ever since the beginning, which has been a blessing to the fans, but really a curse for himself. If I've learned anything from looking back on the one that started it all, it was how solid of a foundation it set for the future of the Smash series. They got a ton of things spot on from the beginning. The gameplay, the detail, even the iconic Challenger approaches screen. Like, dude, it's crazy. And what's even better is they saw the criticism of what they lacked and just went wild with every Smash game following the N64, both outdoing themselves in detail and cramming loads of more content. It just goes to show that if you have a good foundation, it can lead to the structures built upon it being unshakable, or in this case, masterpieces. I applaud Nintendo and the Smash team for taking risks and going above and beyond in their design and concept for this big fighting collaboration. And because of Smash 64's super solid start, we now have the phenomenal series we all know and love today. I enjoyed Smash 64 a lot. I thought it was fun coming back and seeing one of my favorite series, uh, 12 character humble beginnings. But uh, more importantly, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I at least entertained you in any way. But uh, yeah, if you wanna support me in any way, you can drop a like, comment, uh, maybe share it with someone. That is greatly appreciated, makes me happy. Uh, but yeah, I hope to see you guys soon. Again, thanks for watching and I will see you guys Later. I, I, man, I am just very awkward. Okay, I'm just gonna, just gonna end it here. All right.